everybody, and welcome back to episode 3 of the Pac-12 Pigskin Preview. I'm your host, DJ Winter, and on today's episode, we're going to continue the Pac-12 South trend and talk about the Utah Utes. Utah is coming off of a season where they went 7-6 and six overall, but only 3-6 and six in conference. They did find themselves in a bowl game, and that bowl game was the lone win for the Pac-12. They uh, went 1-8, and eight, the Pac-12 did, in bowl games last year, which set a record for the worst record all-time in bowl games for a Power 5 conference. Unlike a lot of the Pac-12 South, the Utes are not going to have a new man at the helm as uh, Kyle Whittingham will enter his 14th season as the head coach of the Utes. He has been there for a while. The biggest storyline for the Utes, in my opinion, heading into next season will be who will be at the wide receiving core and who is going to step up and make plays for them. Their top two wide receivers from last year, Darren Carrington and Raylon Singleton, are now gone, but those two combined for 106 receptions, over 1,500 yards, and nine touchdowns. So that is a good chunk of productivity that they're going to have to find in other guys this year. Um, some of the guys that I think are poised for those big-time roles, and you can see playing and starting, are Siosi Mariner and Damari Simpkins. Mariner had 20 receptions for 393 yards, while Simpkins had 29 receptions for 354 yards. Both of them are juniors, so they've been in the program for a while. They've gotten used to the offense, and so those are a couple reasons why I believe they could be on the field on Saturdays. Um, 300 yards is not bad for a couple of sophomores who served as supporting actors to Carrington and Singleton. Anytime you're getting 300 yards, you're pretty involved in the offense. Now, if we're taking a look at the whole offense, they come off of a year in which they did not see a lot of success. They finished 8th in the Pac-12 in total offense and ninth in scoring offense, so they have their work cut out for them yet again this year. However, this does not come as a shocker because under Winningham, the offense has really always been able to lean on that defense. Like I've stated before on this podcast, having an experienced quarterback pays huge dividends when it comes time to play in those huge games down the stretch in November and December. And at least the Utes have that going for them. Tyler Huntley is coming off of a very good year, and a year in which we saw him throw for 2,400 yards and 15 touchdowns. And like a lot of quarterbacks in the college game today, he is a dual-threat guy who flashed greatness with his legs as well. He rushed for 530 yards and scored for another six touchdowns. He also had a completion percentage of 65%, which was good for third in the Pac-12. If the Utes want to take that next step as an offense, Huntley will be kind of the key to success um, for the Utes. But if there is one thing that will hamper Huntley, it's his interceptions. Last year, he ended up throwing 10 on the season, and I would like to see that number drop to maybe about 5 or 6. He's more than capable of doing this because of that completion percentage which I mentioned is 65%. So I know he's, you know, able to make those smart decisions and make those smart throws. Joining Huntley in the backfield will be junior running back Zach Moss. Utah is a running first team, and I know I said that Huntley was going to be an important piece, but Zach Moss will be just as important. Moss was a stud for Utah last season, racking up more than 1,100 yards and finishing with 10 touchdowns. He also averaged 5.5 yards per carry, so if you give this guy the ball three times, you're going to get a first down, and if Utah can stick with the running game throughout the, throughout the entire contest, Moss will provide a punch for this offense. Those two in the backfield will be a good combo for the Utes, and I definitely expect them to be better than they were on offense last year. Now, if we take a look at the other side of the ball, meaning defense, that unit has always been rock solid underneath Kyle Whittingham, but they are going to have to find some playmakers. They only returned four starters from a defense that finished third in the Pac-12 in scoring defense and third in total defense. The good news for the Utes is that out of those four starters, three of them are going to be in the back end, Chase Hansen, Corian Ballard, and Julian Blackman, and they are all going to have to step up and be leaders this year on that defense. Last season, those three guys were a part of a secondary that finished second in the Pac-12 in pass defensive efficiency. They picked off opposing quarterbacks 14 times, while the opposing teams only completed 55% of the passes. 
And any time you can get a quarterback to complete under 60% of their passes, you're doing something right. The biggest challenge for Kyle Whittingham and his defensive staff will be up front. Anytime you lose three out of your four starters on a defensive line, it is going to be tough to control the line of scrimmage. Games are won and lost at that line. The only returning starter up front for the Utes is Bradley Ane. Ane will be a junior and he will have to take the younger guys underneath his belt and show them how to be successful. But he can do this because he has credibility. Ane recorded 7 sacks and 10 tackles for loss last season, so he knows what it takes. Any way you put it, Kyle Whittingham will have his work cut out for him this year on the defensive side of the ball, no doubt. On the recruiting front for the Utes, they went to the junior colleges and brought in some pretty talented players, and some that could even start in their first season with the Utes. I mentioned before that three out of the four returners on that defense were in the back end, so they have some positions that need to be filled at cornerback and then of course nickelback which has pretty much became a starting role in today's college game because of those spread offenses. The top guy in the incoming class is Jalen Johnson who is a four-star cornerback out of Fresno, California. He found himself in the ESPN top 300 as he sits right there at 183 and had offers from schools like Nebraska, Oklahoma, Florida, and Michigan so he's a big time guy. He has great size at 6'1", 181 pounds, and it has long arms as well, which helps him get his hands on a lot of balls. I very well could see this guy coming in and starting right away at that cornerback position. The next guy is on the offensive side of the ball and comes from Pima Community College. Jordan Agasiva is a monster of a man at 6'5", 300 pounds, and he plays on the offensive line. The Utes have a void right now at guard, and so this is a guy who could definitely come in and play right away, especially with his two years of college experience at the junior college level. I love what this guy has to offer. He has a mean streak in him and finishes his blocks to the whistle on film. He probably had about three or four pancakes that I saw, and so he really shows a lot of aggressiveness, and I just love that with an offensive lineman. The other guy who could start at either cornerback or nickelback is Tyreek Lewis. He went the junior college route as well, and he's out of Riverside Community College. He's another four-star guy who is rated 31st in the top 50 junior college recruits. Lewis is a guy who has great instincts and a knack for picking off opposing quarterbacks. He's not quite as lengthy as Jalen Johnson, so I see him more of a guy who could come in and start at that nickelback position. He's got a little more side-to-side -side quickness and agility the, than Jalen Johnson and so he's more than capable of moving inside and covering those slot receivers. All three of these guys have potential and potential that could put them on the field in their first season at Utah like I mentioned so keep an eye out for them. If we look ahead at the schedule for the Utes it does not start off too hard as they open up Thursday night August 30th which has sort of become a tradition for them to open up on the Thursday night of August when everybody else is uh, they open up with FCS opponent Weber State. After that, they then go on the road and play Northern Illinois. But that should be another cakewalk for them, and they should see themselves sitting at 2-0, and getting ready to start uh, Pac-12 play. They open up Pac-12 play with a huge game against Washington, and that will kind of serve as the tone setter for how their conference slate will go. However, I do not see them getting it done against Washington because UW is really good and poised for a national run at that championship this year. If we continue to look ahead at conference, they really only have a couple games that scare me, and those are Stanford and UCLA, but Oregon and USC come to Salt Lake, and those are going to be tough matchups for the Utes, I believe. Ultimately, they play four games against the North this season in UW, Wazoo, Stanford, and Oregon. I believe that is a bad draw for Utah, and I see them losing three out of those four matchups because, simply put, the North is better than the South right now in the Pac-12. To close out the season, they will have the always anticipated rivalry game with BYU, which they have at home this year, so that should favor the Utes, I believe, paired with the fact that BYU just really hasn't been that good the past couple of seasons. When the dust settles, I think the Utes will finish up the same as last year by going 7-5 and five and getting in that bowl game, but they will sit 4-5 and five in conference. I just don't think their defense is going to be good enough to lean on for the whole year, and they will lose some close games because of that. Alrighty, this has been Episode 3 of the Pac-12 Pigskin Preview. Next time, we will take a look at the Colorado Buffaloes and how they will fare under fifth-year head coach Mike McIntyre. 
I am your host, DJ Winter, and I will see you later.